So, uh, there are so many things going on in the church during the week, actually. At some point, we plan to um, just to, to tell you quite how much is going on, because most people who suddenly get to lift the lid and look at the life of the church all week long are surprised by how much is going on. One of the things that happens is that on a Thursday morning, we do a thing called Coffee and Company. And uh, this is a post-lockdown thing. It's wonderful. There's loads of people here on a Thursday, um, all of the, the wiser end of the age spectrum. Um, and uh, so, uh, some of you are here this morning because of coffee and company. You've, you started coming on Thursdays, and then, and then they made you come on Sundays as well. And now you're here most weeks, and that's just wonderful. Um, and one of the things that happens in Coffee and Company, there's lots of fun things. One of the things is a quiz, which I think possibly Denzel writes. Do you write the No. Ah, Judith writes a quiz. Ah. So there's a quiz, which is a lot of fun. And in the quiz, there's always a Bible question. If I come into the room at the wrong time, I get um, all sorts of people running up to me asking interesting questions about the Bible, but it's just so that they can get the quiz answer right. The quiz this week was, uh, who said it is finished? And it was a multiple choice. It was uh, John the Baptist, someone else, and maybe Jesus um, who <laughs> so several people said to me, who said famously it is finished? And the answer is Jesus, yes. And, and then somebody said to me, what does it mean? Oh, wow, what a great question that is. What, does, what would you say? What does it mean? When Jesus said it's, first of all, when did Jesus say it's finished? As he died on the cross. What does it mean? What did he mean? His earthly work was finished. Yeah, what else? He'd done what? He'd done it. You're just giving me a, another way of saying it is finished. <laughs> That's not an answer. He'd saved us. Did somebody say sins? Saved us from our sins. Is that what you said? Yeah. Yes, it also means it's paid. So our sin is paid for. The, uh, if you like, the devil's paid off or um, the, 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 the payment for sin to God has been made, whichever you want to think about that. Cruz, you've got your hand up. What are you going to say? Wonderful. This happened in assembly on Friday. You're so quiet, I can't hear you from back there. Yes, you were going to say where Jesus died and how he died. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're right. And you're right that remembering he said it's, it finished on the cross. Yeah, yeah. He did. Yes, a crown made of thorns. Yes. Good remembering. Let's talk about it some more later. That's really good remembering. Thank you. Carol. He'd fulfilled God's plan completely, yeah. So, so Jesus says, uh, it's finished. That was in the quiz. How, why am I getting there? Oh, yeah, okay, so, so uh, we're thinking uh, this week about ascension. We're looking forward to Pentecost next week, the coming of the Spirit. And those are things to rejoice over. We rejoice over the fact that it's finished, that Jesus has completed his work. He's returned to the Father. He's promised to send us the Spirit. He has already sent us the Spirit, but we keep praying for the Spirit to be sent to us and fill us. Uh, more and more and more. We rejoice over that, don't we? Isn't that all wonderful? So particularly Ascension and Pentecost, we're thinking about it's finished, it's done, it's completed. Jesus returns to the Father having achieved all that he was supposed to achieve. And there's also this mystery. And the mystery is that the world is still broken. The mystery is that there is still sin and suffering and death and injustice in our world all of the time. Did you see? So we're thinking about the, the, the wonder, the wonder of Ascension and Pentecost, and also the mystery of the fact that although Jesus said it's finished and Jesus always tells the truth, in some ways it feels like it's not quite finished. Today we're going to talk about the work of the kingdom, okay? That's the first thing, the work of the kingdom. To talk about the work of the kingdom, we need to remind ourselves of Jesus' manifesto of the kingdom. And then the third thing is we're going to commit ourselves to the work of the kingdom and to praying for the kingdom. Does that make sense? So, so, so first of all, the work of the kingdom, then what the kingdom was for, the manifesto of the kingdom, and then committing ourselves to it, to that work, and to praying for it. 
You see, Jesus has completed his work, and yet there's still more for us to do. And you, you see that in the, the reading we heard at the beginning of the service from Acts chapter 1, because the, uh, Jesus has given his disciples 40 days uh, uh, since he's been raised from the dead. He's told them all the things that are going to happen next, and he's, he's uh, ascending to his father. And what do they ask him? They say, this, does this really look like the kingdom we hoped for? Is this the fullness of the kingdom? Did, did you hear that question? When are you going to restore the kingdom? And, and, and maybe isn't that our question still? Jesus, you've achieved everything. You've done everything necessary. When are you going to restore the kingdom? When are we going to see the kingdom in its fullness? Now, now th- first of all, let's just notice those disciples were stuck on their idea of a political kingdom. It feels like they can never get past that. And so they say, when are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And they're talking about throwing out the Romans and restoring self-rule. Important things, part of what Jesus is doing, certainly. But it's so much more than that. See, Jesus' vision for the kingdom, he has this vision of the world set up in completely new ways, where people who have been consistently overlooked or oppressed are brought center stage, where the last and the lost and the least are cherished, where those who've had uh, power and influence that they can use to get all they want and get away with all they want are finally judged and brought to justice. And so we heard some of that manifesto from Luke chapter 4, the first public thing that Jesus said. He, he read from Isaiah 61 in the, uh, in the synagogue in Nazareth. Can somebody tell me, just paraphrase, what did he say from Isaiah that we've just heard? The Spirit was on him to preach the good news and to set people free. Yeah, anybody else want to say anything else you heard there? To bind up the brokenhearted and restore sight to the blind and proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. That God's favor isn't just for the rich and the powerful, the the movers and the shakers. No, God's favor, God's blessing is for all. And so we also heard uh, some more from Isaiah 58, but mostly because of all of the books in the Old Testament, Isaiah is the one that most clearly foreshadows Jesus. There's so much in Isaiah that tells us about Jesus, about his priorities, about what he's about, about what he's going to do. And it seems to me like Jesus, uh, his own self-understanding is really shaped by what he's learned and heard in the prophet Isaiah. And so we heard uh, from Isaiah 58, we heard about this community of people who spend themselves for the hungry, who satisfy the needs of the oppressed, who give living water to those who are in need, who uh, go into communities that are broken and restore them and rebuild them, uh, who, who go to those who are homeless and give them secure and safe homes to live in, secure and safe neighborhoods in which to grow and which to bring up their children. This is the vision of the kingdom, of a community of people. We call it the church. It's, it's more. We work with others too, but we call it the church who spend themselves on behalf of those in need so that the world can be changed, so that the world can begin to look more like the vision of the kingdom that Jesus had and saw. And we heard in Isaiah 58, as we give ourselves to that vision, that God will guide us and will strengthen us and will satisfy us as we pursue him and as we, as we pursue that vision for how the world can be. And so in Jesus' name, we, we go to the last and the lost and the least. We go to the overlooked and oppressed. We go to those who've been injured by injustice and abuse and we pour out the oil of healing. We repair and we restore. And, 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 and more than that too, we, we go to the causes of those injustices and that pain and we speak truth to the powers that oppress people and that steal life and that steal from the vulnerable. And, and so we might speak out truth uh, on behalf of those who've been uh, squashed by profiteering multinationals, who've been uh, damaged by powerful self-interests. We speak out against those things and we pray against those things too. Because you see, Jesus is asking us to work with him, to see his vision of the way the world can be, come to fruition, to establish a world where no one is left out, where everybody realizes 
very concretely that they have real and lasting value where anybody uh, is able to experience life in all of its abundance, where there's no misogyny, where there's no racism, where there's no more jobs for the boys or glass ceilings. Yeah, as we throw ourselves into the work of that kingdom, we become more fully the witnesses to Jesus' vision and to all that he is and does to all that he said, witnesses to him, to the ends of the earth, as we live out that manifesto, as we, as we challenge the world, as we change the world, to make it more like the vision that Jesus had, which, was, which is a work we've begun to see happen in Jesus, in, in, in the way that he healed. Lots of Jesus' healings were about bringing isolated people back into community, and in the way that he spoke out against the abuse of power and challenged power. The kingdom, we see the kingdom when the hungry are fed and when the homeless are housed and when injustice and abuse are challenged and not allowed to continue. Are you with me at all? <laughs> Some of you. <laughs> this might sound unfamiliar and you also might be thinking, hang on a minute, how did James just jump from the ascension? to social justice where was the link between those two so <laughs> if it feels unfamiliar or like hang on a minute how does that all fit together it might be because the way we've been told the good news has so often exclusively been about what happens to us when we die you know that uh when we die we want to be safe we want to be with God forever and to make that possible Jesus has died in our place and welcomes us into the presence of the father and that's wonderful good news isn't it but there's more. As somebody said recently, the gospel is not just pie in the sky when we die. It's also steak on your plate while you wait. The good news is that the world can be made new. The good news is also that injustice and equality do not need to last. That poverty can be over. That more and more of the hidden abuse and oppression that is happening in our world all of the time will be called out, will be judged, will be brought into the light. The, the, the news of the kingdom is that we can reimagine the way that we do commerce in, a, in our world and the way that we do politics so that those things consistently serve the common good and not just a chosen few. The good news is that the, the hidden and unfair powers at work in our world will be exposed and will be overturned as we, uh, as we speak out against them, as we pray against them. Some of those perhaps even demonic powers. Uh, as I think about these issues, I, I recognize in my own life a, a, a journey, perhaps over three stages. And, and I'll tell you these three stages because they might be helpful. And, and the first is the idea of charity. And maybe you've thought about this before. So uh, as a, as a, um, uh, maybe as a student when I didn't have very much money. <laughs> I've got very much more now, actually, but that's because I've got six children. Anyway, um, w when I was a student, I might sometimes have some spare money. And I think, oh, I've got a little bit more money left at the end of the month rather than having more month left at the end of the money, which more often happens. I've got a little bit of money left at the end of the month. I don't need this. I could give it to somebody who needs it and go and buy a baked potato for a homeless person or something like that. That, that idea of charity, do you, do you know what I mean? Well, uh, I've, I've got an excess of blessing, so maybe I could pass it on to somebody who needs it. It's, good. it's a good place to start. But, but then, I, then I started to learn a bit more about justice. And um, do, you, do you remember when John the Baptist said, uh, if you've got two coats, what should you do with one of them? You should, you should give one away to the poor, yeah? And, and, so, and so maybe it's not just, I've got a wealth of stuff and I can give some of the extra because I'm feeling a bit generous today. It's more, no, no, I've got too much and it needs to be shared out. One of the church fathers said, your second coat has been stolen from the poor. Ooh, that's good, isn't it? That's a, that's a good reading of what John the Baptist is saying. If you've got two coats, one of them's not yours. It already belongs to the poor. It's justice that you give it away. Justice. Um, thinking about clothing, um, you might remember Tear Fund did a campaign a few years ago about clothing. Um, when you go into those really cheap department stores and you pick something up and you think, wow, how on earth have they managed to make this so cheap? 
they're suggesting you should ask that question a bit further, find out how they have managed to make it so cheap, and perhaps find somebody down the, the chain who has been mistreated or unfairly paid, and, and that we're implicated in that. That's, that's the third thing, thinking about charity, thinking about justice. The, 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 the third stage for me is this idea that um, maybe I don't even really know all the ways that I'm implicated in the injustice and suffering that I see in the world because my sin is still hidden from me. And, and so there's all sorts of ways in which we profit every day from historic and from present day systems of power and abuse of power. And so then maybe there's this injustice which stops the very poorest people in the world, the most vulnerable, from having life in their abundance. And maybe we're implicated in it through the choices that we make, through the lifestyle that we lead. And so, so in that third uh, stage then, the, the, the task is to open our eyes or pray that our eyes would be open to the injustice that we're already part of. And then to begin to dismantle uh, the patterns of domination, the unjust power structures and systems in our, in our world. And maybe some of you are thinking, oh my goodness, this sounds like a bit too right on and woke for a Sunday morning. But, but maybe we do need to explore these things. Maybe we do need to listen to some of those conversations about dismantling domination and about decolonization. Is anyone still with me? <laughs> Good. Do you know, so what I'm trying to do is uh, lay out a significant part, I think, of what Jesus' vision for the kingdom is, of what Jesus has called us to and that he's committed us to. And, 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 you know, when, when you begin to explore it and see quite how much of us might need to change and quite how much Jesus still wants the world to change, you can see the, the, uh, the great draw of wanting to narrow the gospel down, wanting to make the gospel just about where you go when you die. You know, if it's just about where you go when you die, then it's much less disrupting. It's much less challenging for our lives today. When I was, um, this is where this came from, when I was thinking about this sermon this week, what struck me in that reading in Acts 1, in that story of the ascension, um, was this. I realize this is a slightly poetic reading of the passage. But, um, I, but can you just imagine the disciples, Jesus has gone, and they're gazing. And where are they gazing? Uh, up into heaven. The, the, the NIV Bible we read said up into the sky, but it's actually the same word for heaven. So it's, it talks about Jesus who's gone into heaven, Jesus who's come from heaven. And then at the end of the story, disciples who have stood gazing up into heaven, gazing up into heaven when there's other things to be getting on with, passively gazing up into heaven, just daydreaming about the by and by. Now, this is so often what the church can do, isn't it? We can just be focused on life after death as a way perhaps even of ignoring all of the pain of life right now and how Jesus calls us to bring his kingdom into all those areas of pain, that the world can be made new in his name and in the power of the Spirit. You see, we're not to focus on just heaven, because Jesus is building his kingdom now, and he's inviting us to partner with him now. And so, so in Acts 21, then, it's just really fun that the angel comes and disrupts this moment of heavenly contemplation <laughs> and says, why are you standing there looking into heaven? <laughs> and it's like the angel saying, Jesus has ascended and is sending the Spirit, but that means there's work to do, or at least once you've received the Spirit, there's lots of work to do. The world needs reimagining. The gospel that Jesus has preached needs living out. The kingdom needs to take more and more ground. The, 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 the way of Jesus needs more witnesses. The Greek word witnesses is where we get our word martyr from. The, the gospel needs more witnesses and it might even be painful to witness to that gospel. And we do that now and here and we do it to the ends of the earth. We we go and we tell what we've seen in Jesus and we live out the good news that we've heard from him and we pray for the kingdom to come through our actions and through other means too. So church, we're, we're not supposed to stand just gazing into heaven. We're supposed to be working to see the kingdom of God 
fully established here on earth. Established more, fully established when Jesus returns. So I wonder, is that a big enough vision to plow your life into? Is that a big enough dream to pledge your allegiance to? Is that a, a, a grand enough task to spend your whole life on? Jesus' vision for the new world, the good news of the kingdom, is worth everything. Jesus said it's like a, a pearl hidden in a field. You could spend your whole life on it, and you would not be cheated out of anything. Jesus is building his kingdom here and now, and it's changing the world. And he's saying to each of us, will you join me? There's this, I think, this perennial temptation to make the gospel only otherworldly. But Jesus, who has returned to his Father, Jesus, who promises again and again to fill us with his Spirit, is saying to us, don't just stand there daydreaming about heaven. The world needs you. The world needs the good news of the kingdom. The world is in dire need of change and transformation. And it's as if Jesus is saying to us again, I send you in my name, even to the ends of the earth, to witness to me and to my vision of what the world can become. In the kingdom of God, the hungry are fed, the homeless are housed, the unlovely are cherished, destroyed communities are rebuilt. Injustice and abuse are called out and ended. Unjust power structures are dismantled. Jesus is enthroned at the right hand of the Father. And through his victory, the victory of the cross and the victory of the resurrection, he is shaking and remaking the world. And so as we lived as witnesses to him and to his work, all of the earth will come to hear and see his love and his forgiveness and justice and compassion will reign to the ends of the earth. So I invite you to say yes again to this Jesus, to say yes to his kingdom, not just as a future thing, but as a here and now, ever increasing thing, world shaking thing. Let's say yes to him. Let's be filled with his spirit so that we're equipped to do the work he's given us. Let's continue to pray for the kingdom to come. And let's be witnesses to his kingdom in all that we say and do wherever he sends us. Amen.